Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everybody. My name is Julian. I'm an alcoholic. It's uh, really nice to be here. have the opportunity to share with everybody a little bit about my experience, strength, and hope. But it's not actually a little bit. So 55 minutes is a lot. <laughs> Probably be bored of listening to me. If I get 55 minutes, it'll be a miracle. So um, it may be a much shorter. Um, but today has been a good day. Um, Thank God it's been a good day because yesterday was a nightmare. Yesterday was just one of those days where the the spiritual malady, the, the alcoholic illness was just on me yesterday. I was just, I woke up, I was irritable, I was discontent. I was, uh, it brought me back to those early days that when I first came into recovery, I was just, I was on edge just all day long and it just it didn't get any better, it just got worse. You know, I went to a meeting last night and the person who was doing the chair, I just I couldn't listen to, I couldn't relate. Everybody that shared back, I thought they were talking nonsense. Just I felt in the wrong place and I was just really glad to get my head on the pillow last night and get to sleep. Another sober day, you know, and Sometimes people say in the sharing meetings that, you know, if you get your head on the pillow and you haven't had a drink, it's a success, you know, and that was it. It was the minimum success for me. It was just to get through that day. And then today has just been really nice, you know. I got up this morning, said my prayers. I took about an hour this morning to pray, to read, to meditate. To reflect, do some writing, and then went about my day, and everything's been good. No oh, one is my my life like that is quite simple. You know, whenever I do what I am supposed to do, my life's good. You no, know? but yesterday I didn't do what I was supposed to do. No, I was too busy. I was too wrapped up in being Julian. I was selfish. I was self centered. I just wasn't interested in others or what I could bring to life. Oh, I paid the price for it. Um, you know, and that's kind of, yeah, it's always been like a, I mean, I was just, just reflecting just before I started sharing. It's, I've been around for a while. Oh, I think this is my, I've just done six, well, in October, October 2022, I was 16 years sober. So this is my 17th year. You know, so it's been it's been a while, but it's still a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. You no, know? once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. That's the thing. You know, and just a little bit about me is, I was born. I grew up in Northern Ireland. I'm the eldest of seven. I grew up in a very violent community in a very troubled part of Northern Ireland, you know. And I grew up just not feeling that I fitted in. You know, I didn't fit in with my family. I always felt like an alien. Even though I'm like, I look like my mum and dad, I always thought I was adopted. You know, I just felt, never felt comfortable. We would sit around the dinner table. You know, and my dad would be telling like his day about what he'd done at work and everybody would be engaging with him and laughing and joking. And I just thought, what are you that? What are you on? It's just like, no, I just used to think it wasn't interesting. I don't get the jokes. I don't, you know, it's just, I just felt, you know, what I felt was that I was just wrapped in a little bubble, you know, and that everything else went on outside of this bubble. And within my bubble, I didn't really feel the emotions or the, the feelings that everybody else had, you know, it just felt like everybody else was expressing. I could see on their face this happiness and joy and they were laughing. But there was none of that inside my bubble. 
you know, I just, I, I was just confused from a really early age, you know, and that's just how it was. You know, I just, I always felt different, you know, and from a really, from as far back as I can remember, you know, I just, I always sought to isolate and get away from people to feel comfortable. You know, I used to climb trees. My nickname was Monkey. All my friends called me Monkey. So I was just always climbing in trees, not climbing up to the top of trees just to, to get away from people. Because I felt, you know, that up there I was safe, that people couldn't get up to me, that I was up above everybody else and I could look down and I felt safe and secure, that I could survey everything below me and nothing could get at me. You know, and I just, I just always felt uncomfortable, just always felt uncomfortable. And you know, I remember I was always trying to change how I felt, even from a very, very early age. And, you know, it's like my first go at change and how I felt was just binge eating sweets and drinking Coke. You know, I don't know what age I was, maybe like five or six. You know, I'd get these like big bags of sweets and stuff and I would be lying on the bed, dying. I was going to be sick, you know what I mean? But there would be sweets left and I was just like, like forcing them into me. I just, I couldn't stop. You know, I just, I couldn't leave some of those sweets for tomorrow, you know, out of a bottle of Coke and I just had to drink the whole thing, you know. I just fucking, it didn't matter if I was physically sick. I just couldn't stop, you know. And then I started getting into basically hyperventilating and fainting, you know, getting electric shocks, sticking my hand in light bulb sockets and stuff. You know, just anything for a buzz, anything to just change how I felt. You know, and then whenever I went to school, it was basically, I was only probably about 10 and I I was like really badly into sniffing petrol, you know. I just asked was what people done and it was like I loved it. I totally and utterly loved it, you know, sniffing petrol all the time. And then when I went to secondary school, started um, on the tip axe dinners, you know, and then it was like sniffing glue. It was just anything, just anything, you know. Long before I had a drink, I was just, just anything that would change how I felt. Just give me a, do you know what I mean? If somebody said, Julian, this changes how you feel, I wouldn't even have asked you what it does, what's the consequences, just boom, in, gone. That's it. You know, it was just, that's how I was, you know, long before I had a drink, long before I had a drink. Um, I had my first drink with about seven friends. But I say the word friends now, but they didn't feel like friends then, you know. Def, I didn't understand the word friends, you know. The, the whole concept was just, it was alien to me. They were people that I grew up with. There were people in my house and state. There were people I went to school with. There were people I walked to school with, I walked home with, played football with, had dinner with. But they were never friends. I didn't really understand what friends was because I always felt this separation, you know that there was a competition, that there was this male thing that was, you had to be bigger, you had to be badder, you had to be faster, you, you know, it was just like, but we didn't speak about it, it was all secret. Nobody speaks about it, but we all know, we all know the competition is on. We all know it's a war, we all know, you know, it was unspoken, and that's what it felt like for me, that was just always hyper vigilant. it was always hyper alert, watching everybody, because it was like, it was competition, it was a fucking war. And then growing up in Northern Ireland, that didn't help, you know. And that's how I was and went for a drink with these people whenever I was 14 years of age. And everybody went to the off license. They all decided they were going to get two tins of Budweiser. You know, it was our first drink, two tins of Budweiser. And I was just sitting surveying, listening to what everybody was doing. And they were going to get two tins. And I said, what are you getting, Julian? I was like, oh, I think I'm going to get four tins and a half bottle of Buckfast, you know. But that was just typical. Everybody else was getting two, but I wanted more, you know, because I wanted to change myself just more, you know. Two was good enough for you. It wasn't going to be good enough for me because I didn't feel right inside. You know, I never felt right. And if two was going to do it for you, there was no way it was going to do it for me. 
You know, and I realize now, you know, I didn't know then, but it's just this disease, this illness, this more, you know. It, no matter what it was that I had, it was just never right. You know, this sense of it being unsatisfactory. You know, if I was happy, I wasn't happy enough. You told me you loved me, it just, you know, just wasn't the right kind of love. You know, if I had money, it just wasn't enough money. Didn't matter what it was. Nice sunny day, yeah, but it could be sunnier. No, oh, the sea's lovely, Julian, in it. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, just, oh, it didn't matter. It was just a total sense of everything being unsatisfactory. You know, and we went for this drink anyway. It was basically, they had all got their two tins of Budweiser. I got my four tins of Budweiser and half bought the book fast. And I remember about halfway through that second tin of Budweiser, and it was like, it was like a biblical scene. You know, it felt like the clouds opened, the sun just shone down. You know, I looked across the garden for the first time in my life at my friends. You know, there was no war, there was no fight. Everything was peaceful, everything was calm. Here I was at peace and ease. With my brothers, my friends, I was like a friend among friends. I was a man among men, you know, on this sense of peace and ease and comfort. And it was just like, wow, wow. You know, it just, it totally and utterly changed everything. It was like a spiritual experience for me. It was a total and utter spiritual experience. I'd never, ever have I felt like that before in my life, ever. You know, I was like blown away. I was like, man, fuck. You know, and this was the thing. You know, I know this now, you know, but this is what happened. They all had that sense of ease and comfort and they sat on their two tins of beer and they hovered around that sense of ease and comfort and they just hung around there for hours. Had a little sip. Some of them didn't continue to drink. Some of them didn't finish it, you know. But they enjoyed that sense, that ease and comfort, you know, and they just, they loved it. They interacted with each other. What did I do, you know? Again, it just wasn't, you know, it was good, but there was something else beyond that that I wanted. No matter what it was that I had, I had to change it. I had to change it. Had to, you know? So I didn't hang around with all of my brothers at that sense of ease and comfort, just enjoying that. I just went fucking flying past it. Four tins of Budweiser, half bottle of Buckfast, blackout, land in a pool of vomit. No, bleh. that was a. You know, that was my first drunk. At 14 years of age, you know, I experienced that sense of ease and comfort, that spiritual experience, which I chased for the rest of my life. You know, I chased that sense, that feeling for the rest of my life. I remember it now, honestly, I can close my eyes, I can see it and I can be there, I can feel it, I can see everybody that was there. I remember all the details, everything, everything, because I'm an alcoholic, I remember it all. I bet you none of them remember, not in the detail that I do. No, that was my first drink. My second drink was similar half bottle of whiskey, drank it really quick, ended up crawling two mile home on my hands and knees. You know, I fell asleep, I don't know how many times along the way, I was just totally and utterly out of it. That was my second drunk. And that's just how I drank. And that is how I drank from the age of 14 until I was medically detoxed from alcohol at the age of 33 at Millview Hospital in Brighton. You know? And when I was about 27, I basically, I got into a situation where I just had humiliated myself, you know, humiliated myself in front of 
my family, in front of my partner, in front of my son, you know, just another time, just one more time that I just humiliated myself in front of everybody. No, nothing really overly special about it. Wasn't the worst, you know, definitely wasn't the worst. But I think it was basically, it touched the nerve of a few people. So the next day, um, I said I'd go to a meeting of AA because they were all saying, you know, you need to sort it out, Julian. I was at 27. I went to the meeting in Belfast. And I walked in and all I, I was still, like, I was still drunk when I went to that meeting. I went in and everybody was packed into this little room. And they were all smoking. And it was, I just felt really claustrophobic. And I just kept looking at the steps were just sitting on like a wall just straight in front of me and I was like about three foot away from it and I just kept reading it and I just kept focusing in on the word God and I heard a few people in that meeting mention the word God and talk about higher powers and these different experiences that they had that I was confusing and mixing up being I thought it was a religious society you know and I come out and my partner she looked at me and she said, well, how was the meeting? And she had this look of hope on her face, you know, that somehow that I was going to, I was going to change, that I was going to quit drinking, that I was going to stop humiliating her and humiliating myself, and, you know. But she was a devout atheist, you know. And I said, all they done was speak about God. And she just looked at me and she says, oh, it's not going to be for you, is it? And I just, in my heart, I just had this little mini fist pump. I just went, yes, no. Because I thought, I went because you wanted me to go. I've done it. Now you're off my back. Tick the box. Oh, I can just continue, you know. And it took me just over six years to basically get back to my next meeting. You know? And if God scared me out of that first meeting, my alcoholism scared me in to my second meeting. You know, so by the time I got to my second meeting at the age of 33, I didn't care about the word God. I didn't care about anything. I was, you know, I was suicidal. It was either... You know, I hear people share about it, and uh, it was either homicide, homicide or suicide. I was going to kill somebody or kill myself. You know, I couldn't quit drinking. I was my life was just a complete and utter mess. You know, complete and utter mess. I drank every day. Every day I wanted to quit, and every day I would end up drunk. You know, and for those six six and a half years. The same thing happened to me every day, every day. And I'm not talking, it was the most monotonous, mundane, boring existence for, for six and a half years. And it was basically, I would get up in the morning, dying of a hangover, and I'd be like, I'd always be late. I'd just always be late for work. You know? And I'd get up and I'd have this unquenchable thirst and my skin would be crawling and I'd fall asleep in my clothes. I didn't go to bed. You know, I'd probably piss myself. You know, I'd get up, I'd be shaking, you know, and I'd be thinking, oh, man, no. It's like, and I'd just be like the despair, you know. It's like the four horsemen. It would just be on me, that terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. You know, it was just on me, just crawling on me. You know, and then I'd just try to get myself ready to go out to work, you know, and I'd just be like saying, never again today. It, just, it has to be different, Julian. It has to be different today. It has to be. It can't go on like this, man. It can't go on. You know, and it was like I'd come shaking out of, you know, out of the house, up to the train station. I'd get into work. I'd like be shuffling into work with a head down. You know, I wouldn't look at anybody. Couldn't speak at anybody in case they'd smell me. You know, put my head down and be like, trying to work away, but my head would just be, it was all over the place, you know. I'd just be trying to avoid people, trying to avoid eye contact. You know, I'll have a couple of cups of coffee and then things would just, you know, by about 10 o'clock, I'd be starting to calm down a little, 
you know. And then at lunchtime, I'd just be thinking, you know, I need to go and get some food. So I'd go and get some food, come back, and then I'd start, I'd be kind of feeling all right, you know. I'd forget, I nearly forgot about everything that had happened in the morning time, you know. I would have something to eat, something to drink, and I'd be, there, I'd nearly be feeling normal. Oh. And then I would start, you know, with these big resolutions, you know, it's like today, you know, it's going to be different. I'd have this clarity of mind and I'd just think, you know, I'm just going to go home and I'm just going to sort it all out, you know, and I would make this big list of stuff. I'd just say, I'll go back today and I'm going to clean the house and I'm going to open the bills. I'm going to pay that, I'm going to make that bag transfer. You know? I'm going to pay back that money. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to phone my, my kids. You know, I've walked out with my kids years before. You know? I'm going to phone my kids. I'm going to tidy the house. I'm going to like make some food. Go for a run. You know, the list just went on and on and on of all of the stuff that I was going to do. It, it, today, it was going to be different. Today was the day that I'm going to make the change. You know, I'm, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You know, and I have this big long list, and then I'll just convince myself that I'm just every day I just convince myself I'm this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm by about three o'clock, I'll be going, do you know what? Actually, I'll do all of that, and I'll just have a couple. I'll just have, I'll have a couple. Because, like, but if I do all of that, I might mean, just reward myself, it'll be totally cool. Do all of that there, go home, do it all, have a couple. Do you know what I mean? It'll be cool. I promise you, at five o'clock, I was like a greyhound out of the traps. It would be like five o'clock, boom, straight to the off license, you know? And I would buy two tins of Stella. I worked in Hayward's Heath and I lived in Hove. And the train used to take 17 minutes from Hayward's Heath to Hove. And I couldn't get on that train without two tins of Stella. You know? On the first one, I'd be shaken with, you know, the shakes had left me now, but this was just anticipation, excitement, you know, that I was going to, I was going to get my, going to get booze. You know, and I'd be shaking like that and be fucking spilling down me, you know, and I'd just, just down it outside the off license. I'll have another one. And whether that one made it onto the train with me, sometimes if the train was even delayed three minutes, wasn't getting on, you know. But I was just ashamed on the platform looking around because there was work colleagues there and I was like, sometimes, you know, in the beginning I was hiding from that. At the end, I didn't care, you know. But invariably, I tried to sneak on the train and have it on the train, you know. And I'd basically get off the train and hove. The second tin would be gone. And I had a four-minute walk from Hove train station down to Blottington Road, and I couldn't do it, you know, couldn't do it. I'll be back in the off-license again, and then I'd get down to Blottington Road, and then I'd pop into the co-op, you know, and I was going in to buy all the food and do all the stuff that I said I was going to do, and I'd just go in there, and I'd just go, do you know what? I just fucking, I, I know what I'd do. I'll just... I'll buy a few beer now. I'll go back to the house. Just fucking constantly, constantly lying to myself. Constantly. You know, but the thing was, I didn't even know I was lying. This is the thing. It was that thing about alcoholism, isn't it? Is denial. Didn't even know I'm lying. I didn't even know it. I'll just, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just go in now. I'll just buy a few beer. I'll go back and I'll tidy the house. I'll do all of that other stuff. And then when I know what I want to eat, because I don't really know what I want to eat just now, I'll go back, I'll do all of that stuff, I'll have a couple of beer, and I'll come back up and get the food later. You know? And then I'd be back in the house, and I'd just stop being, man, you know? By the time I got back into the house, I'd be back in the house an hour, and I would be on, like, five or six beers. You know? And then I'd just be, like, really frustrated. I'd just be like, have you done this again? How? How? You fucking ended up drunk again. How? 
I promise you, and I'd be like so frustrated. I just thinking how, how, oh, and I'd be like banging my head at the wall. I'd be like thinking fucking hell, and it's, I just wanted it to end. You know, I just I wanted it to end, and this just went on for what, fucking six years. It's just like I know people have these like really torturous rock bottoms. But mine was just, it was like, it was, I, it just, it felt, it was like being bound and gagged and just pulled along the ground for six and a half years with just no control over anything, you know. Forced to drink. I didn't even want to drink, you know, but I was drinking every day. Oh. And at the end, I'd just given up, you know, I'd just given up. Because I just, I can't do it. I was so confused. You know, I just, I just, I didn't know what to do. You know, who I was. You know, I could never admit that there was something wrong. But I knew that something wasn't right. I just knew that something wasn't right. You know, how can I not just, how can I not get a day without drinking? I just didn't understand it. No, I, I just didn't understand it. You know, and I remember at that time, friends would invite me to go out for a drink and stuff. And it was like, at the beginning of that six and a half year period, you know, if they, they'd be meeting in the pub on a Saturday afternoon to watch the football. And if the football started at three, they'd meet at the pub at about half two. And I'd be turning up to the pub at half two, pissed, you know. Pissed. Because I'd have been on it. You know, Saturday morning, I'd have been drinking all Friday night because there was no work. I'd have been up at like four or five o'clock Saturday morning, dying, you know, and straight on it. So I'd be turning up there, pissed. And then after a couple of years, it's just like, I couldn't go, you know, because I couldn't turn up the pub at two o'clock or half two, totally and utterly pissed because I could only drink a couple of pints and I was like really antisocial. I hated everybody, you know, because they weren't drinking fast enough. They weren't, you know, drinking long enough. They weren't everything. And I just, I become a social recluse and just drank by myself because that's where this disease wants me, you know just wants me in the bedroom by myself, you know. Curtains closed, not engaging with anybody, not answering the phone because I'm afraid who it may be, not answering the door because I think it's stono. Is it bailiffs? Is it my, my, my... Has my ex-partner turned up with my son? You know, because, come on, let's go and find daddy because he's not answering the phone. I don't know. No, oh, is it? I don't know who's after me. I just, I was hiding from everybody. I owed loads of money. I was just, my life was just a mess. You know, it's a mess. Oh, and I went to the doctor and I just said to the doctor, I just, no, I can't stop drinking. And the doctor basically had me in for. For a detox in about three weeks. And I swear them next three weeks were just like torture, you know, because then I was just like, I was re I just went for it, you know. I didn't know actually know if I was going to make it to get into the detox because I was just drinking injuriously. Just I just wanted it to be over, you know. And I was just like down and. No, I was just, it was horrendous. And then I got there, I went into the detox and, you know, I fucking loved it. I totally and utterly loved it. You know, basically like a secure unit, you're locked up. You no, know, I loved it. I didn't drink, you know, that was it. I was there with like, I can't remember, there was about 10 of us. You know, we weren't drinking, 
we were basically being fed. We were like free teas. For us, it felt like free tea, free coffee, books. You know what I mean? Vitamin injections, in Librium. You no, know, drugged up. And I, I, I honestly, I told, I loved it. I didn't want to leave. I felt secure. I felt happy. I was happy that I'd quit drink. You know. I think about it now. That was at the time thinking this is as good as my life has been. This is as happy as I can be to be locked up in a secure unit in a hospital and to be happy, to be thinking this is cool. That's where my fucking disease took me. That's where this, you know, this insane that I was loving that experience thinking, wow, you have landed now, Julian. How cool is this? The secure lock up in a hospital. Man, it's just the same. I can't even believe it, you know, that I say that, but it's true. You know, we were introduced to AA, and the people come in from CA and come in from A on the held meetings, you know, and it was amazing, man, because you know, you got a little bit of introduction to what it was that you needed to do. And, Every nearly everybody that worked in that hospital, all the nurses, all of the people, all the, the the rehab staff, they were all just like, get to AA. When you leave here, go to AA. And I can remember just being released from there, and it was like thirty three years of age, and it was about two miles from where I lived, and I can remember getting released from it on a Friday afternoon, and just like thinking, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I was so full of fear, you know. I didn't have anybody, you know. I'd burned all my bridges. Not even had I burned my bridges. I'd blown them up, you know. There was nobody, nobody, you know, that was coming to walk me home. No, there was nobody coming to meet me. I can remember thinking how, in my head, I couldn't think how I could get from the hospital to the house without passing a pub or an off license. I didn't know a way, you know. I was just so afraid that now for the first time that, you know, I was going to have to try and navigate this by myself. You know, that this was my freedom. I swear I never was as, you know, if you had asked me, oh, are you afraid, Julian? I said, no because I would never have expressed fear to you, you know, not where I grew up, because you would never say to someone you were afraid. Was the, you'd have got the shit kicked out of you. You'd have been beat to have been an inch of your life. You'd have been called a coward. You'd have been called all sorts, you know. I grew up in a very brutal community that you just, you didn't say that sort of stuff, you know. And if someone had said, are you afraid? It's like, no way am I afraid. I'm not afraid to fucking kill you. I was afraid, you know. And I was trying to navigate my way home. And I remember just walking back and getting into the house. And just, there was an armchair in the living room and just gripping it, you know. And I was like so tense, just holding on to this seat. And just like feeling safe that I got into the house and that the world was out there and that I'm not fucking going out. Not going out, I'm staying, I'm staying here. But I was petrified, you know. And I remember a girlfriend come home from work, and she says to me, "This was like a couple of hours later." And she says, "What do you want to do?" I was like, "What do you mean?" She says, "What do you want to do?" I says, "No, I heard you the first time. What do you mean?" She says, what do you want to do? And I was like, I was like, going to lose it. I was going, what do you mean? What do I want to do? And she says, Julian, she says, it's Friday evening. What do you want to do? And I just thought, fuck. Oh. Just wanted to cry. That's what I wanted to do. I never felt 
as lost in my life, you know. What I want to do, what I wanted to do was the only thing that I knew to do. The only thing that I had ever done in my life was to drink. That's what I wanted to do. Oh. I didn't know why I was living in how I ended up in Brighton and Hove, why I was in a relationship, why I was in this house, you know. I didn't know, I just, I hadn't a clue. I just felt lost, totally and utterly lost, you know. I drank because I was happy. I drank because I was sad. I drank because I had money. I drank because I had no money. I drank because I was angry and frustrated. I drank because I needed to tell you that I loved you. I was afraid you were going to reject me. I drank because we were going on holiday. I drank because I couldn't afford to go on holiday. No, was just all I'd ever done was drink. I'm sitting here, 33 years of age. I've never done anything else. And you ask me, what do I want to do? And it was just like, wow. I have a clue, you know. The longest relationship, the most meaningful relationship that I've ever had in my life was with alcohol. You know, and it was ended in that detox center. You know, and when I come out fresh, you know, it was it was a very, very scary, very, very painful experience, you know. And thank God that I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, thank God. Because I just I got myself to a meeting because that's all I knew, you know. That's all I knew. And I remember going to meetings and I didn't, you know. I basically pop into the meeting just as the meeting was starting. And as soon as it was over, I just disappear. And the meeting that I used to go to was on twice a week, just around the corner from me. And at the end of the meeting, everybody used to it used to go around the room and everybody would introduce themselves. My name's John, I'm an alcoholic. My name's Sandra, I'm an alcoholic. And I just thought, oh, fuck, man, no way. No way. No, no way. I just, this was, this is the insanity of it. My life was a complete mess. The only place I knew to go was the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I wouldn't accept it. I wouldn't be part of it, you know. It's just pure, just insanity, total and utter insanity. I went to the meetings and wouldn't get involved in it. I just thought, look, you might need a gauze and you might need a program. Maybe, you know, but it's not for me. You know, I just want to quit drinking. I just want to quit drinking. You know, and for three months, i done just that. Mere attendance at meetings, you know. I used to just go to meetings and then just go home. And I bought the big book. So I did, and I can remember I used to, because I used to hear people talking about, you know, this the get yourself a copy of the big book. It tells you what you suffer with, sets out the solution. You know. And it's basically, I got the big book and I can remember just reading it, just, you know, over and over and over reading it and just thinking, what are they talking about? It's just like, this is not fixing me. Solution, this is not a solution to my problem. It's like a book. You know, I can remember after three months of basically just going to meetings and I ended up over at Beachy Head and I just thought, you know what, actually, if this is, if this is, not drinking, it's shit, you know, shit. I don't want it, you know. And I was in that place where I knew that I didn't want to go back drinking because it had taken me so long to get off it and I desperately wanted to quit for years, you know. And I was thinking, well, if this is not drinking, it's like, I don't want it, it's shit, you know. I just, I can't go on, it's just so painful. It's just so, so painful, man. 
No, it was non-treated alcoholism. No, stark raving sober. I just put the drink down, and I, you know, I was going insane, totally and utterly insane. You know, I hated everybody. I was restless. I was irritable. I was discontent. It was like, yeah, it was a nightmare. Um, obviously went to Beachy Head, had a little racky about, and then I didn't do it. You know, I had too much to drink when my mind changed because so I cycled over there. And somewhere between leaving Brighton and cycling over to Eastbourne and getting to Beachy Head, it kind of changed my mind. And then I just it just basically went there. I had a little bit of a look around and then basically cycled back home again when I seen how many people was around. You know, and I went to, back to the meeting and someone that I just admired at the meeting for the, over this past three, over them three months. Because he, he's not like me, you know, a little small tubby fella. He plays golf, runs his own business, totally and utterly nothing like me. You know? But he used to come into the meeting and he would share about problems and stuff that was going on in his life. And then he would just share about a solution to those problems. And then he would outline a program of recovery. How I was going to apply the program to that problem. And he was just really happy, really relaxed. And I just thought, wow, it's just like, how do you, I just like, how do you feel like that? How do you just, how can you like be like how you are? It's just like, it's just like, it amazed me. I just thought, how? Oh. You know, when I approached him and I said, you know, will you help me? And he said to me, he says, what have you been doing, Julian? I said, what do you mean? He says, what have you been doing? I was like, what do you mean, Mom? Sorry. He says, what have you been doing? I was like, oh, look, I'm really sorry, man. You're going to have to explain to me. He says, well, basically, he says, you have gone into detox. He says, you've come out, you've put the drink down. He says, and that's it. And then in that moment, I just kind of realized that, you know, that the drink wasn't the problem. And I was the problem, you know. And then when I thought about all of my childhood and all of the restlessness and the irritability and the drugs and the glue and the solvents and the petrol and how I felt and how I was feeling then. You no, know, drink was my solution to Julian, was my problem. You no, know, it was like a kick in the balls. I just thought, fuck, you know. No, but it was that moment of realization for me that you know, the alcohol's in the bottle, the alcoholism is in me. I'm putting down drink, not drinking doesn't treat alcoholism. You no. Know? Take away the alcohol, you still have the ism. And that was it. I was just suffering from this internal spiritual malady. You know, and he had a solution. AA had a solution, which was to follow the program. You know, and he said to me, you prepared to go to any lengths? And I hadn't even a clue what he meant, you know, but I knew the answer was yes. I just looked at him and I said, yeah. He says, when you get this, are you willing to pass it on to another man? I was like, thinking, fucking hell, wow. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, I couldn't even help myself. I was going to help somebody else. You know, but that's, we all need to do it, isn't it? Is to ask for that help and it's that, you know, it's just another little, um, just another little surrender, isn't it? You know, we have all many surrenders along the way, you know. I had a little surrender when I went to the doctor. I had another surrender when I turned up for the detox. 
you know, had another surrender when I walked home from the detox without going into the off license. Had another surrender when I went back to A. You know, just surrender all the time. And this was another one asking another man to help me. You know, for the first time in my life, I had basically gone up to someone, you know, asked for help. And then I met him, you know, we met. We met once a week and I went through the steps really quickly because I had that, I just was desperate because my life was a mess. My life was worse three months into, three months not drinking and not doing anything to deal with that internal spiritual malady. I was worse than I'd ever been at any stage of my drinking. You know? and I realized this is sober condition, this, you know, and if we're not going to drink, we got to treat the ism. Just putting down the drink and the drugs, just it's not going to cut it, you know. There's three, you know, my experience is, is that there's three states for the alcoholic to be in, and there isn't any other ones. There's basically a functioning alcoholic, drinking, using. Then there's a non-drinking, no one using alcoholic. And then there's a recovering alcoholic. You know, and I've tried all three of those. And there's only one of them that I want now, which is the recovering alcoholic. Because it's the only one that has given me peace of mind permanently. You know, I'm out with that man. I just I start going through the program, you know, and it's just been amazing for me. No step one, admitting that I was part of sober alcohol, and that my life was in management. No, it was clear to me. I knew I was part of sober alcohol. I knew my life was unmanageable. Totally. No, I knew for those six and a bit years that I couldn't put it down, and that my life was a mess. I knew. My life was always unmanageable. Since I was a child, it was unmanageable. You no, know, totally and utterly powerless over alcohol. But as I'm powerless over alcohol, I've come to believe that I'm also powerless over people, places, and things. You no, know, but in relation to my alcoholism and how I treat Julian, you know, it's basically we're talking about alcohol. So I'm powerless over alcohol first and foremost. You know, a lack of power is our dilemma. We have to find a power greater than ourselves, you know. And that's the solution for me is this program and that. So for me, the step one, I'm powerless, you know, and I do, I concede to my innermost self that I'm alcoholic. Every morning I get up, I get on my knees and I concede to my innermost self that I'm alcoholic and I pray for another sober day. Every morning, every morning. Because I acknowledge I'm powerless, you know. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Just because I've been around for a period of time doesn't mean to say somehow that I'm fixed, you know. And then for me, with the higher power thing, the step two, you know, I kind of struggled with it in the beginning. I really struggled. You know, I just... I, I genuinely thought that I can never get this because... I was just so anti-God and I felt so far away from spirituality and from a higher power and from God that I just thought, I can't get this. Even when I wanted it, even when I was so desperate, you know, even after I approached my sponsor, you know, I just thought, maybe this is the bit, maybe I just, I'm not going to get it. Maybe I'm just one of those ones that they speak about in the book, you know, those unfortunates. Oh, and, I really struggled. I was reading all of these like books on theology and philosophy, and you know, I thought that I could intellectualize God and a higher power. Oh, I genuinely thought I, I thought I just read. I can understand that. If I read a little bit about God, then maybe I'll understand. Well, I wasn't getting there, you know. I wasn't getting there. Well, I can remember. While I was having this struggle, I was there was it was a February. So I came in in October and there was a big storm. I think it was 
2007, 2007, 2008, February 2008. And I was walking from Brighton up to Hove. So I was walking like east to west and there was a southwesterly storm coming in and it was ferocious, you know. It was blowing the sh- like there was foam coming across like up over the beach and over the promenade and across the road and the shingle was getting thrown across the promenade and like waves it was crazy but the the wind would just blow like big gusts and it would like it was like struggling to get up you were like oh like pushing the try and get up the beach and the next minute the wind would ease up and then I would walk forward a little bit and then another huge big gust of wind would just come and it just felt just felt like a hand you know and basically I'll be trying to push up the beach and I couldn't move. I just could not get up the beach no matter how hard I tried. And the next minute, it just felt like the hand just let me go. And I just started walking up the beach. And then another big like gust would just come and it just, it just felt like it just stopped me. And I swear, that's what it felt like. It just felt like a hand on my chest holding me, holding me, pushing me back. And then it would just ease up. And I can just remember, wow, I just thought that the wind is a higher power. It's a power greater than me. If it wants me to go down that promenade, I'll go. If it doesn't want me to go down that promenade, I'm not going. I just thought, wow. And I just remember just standing like in awe, you know, just seeing the waves smashing the beach and the shingle, honest to God, it was just like, I just, felt this power and this presence and I just thought, wow. Wow. You know, and I wish I could say, you know, I went home and that was the beginning, you know, if nothing has ever been the same again, but it's not, you know, that was just one little spiritual experience for me. You know, but I went back and still I got back into Julian's selfish, self-centered ways, you know, thinking that I could run the show, thinking that I'd have my little spiritual awakening now, oh, cool, I've done that kick the box, let's go back to Julian's way. You know, I was just overcoming resentment, you know, it was like the mother of my son wouldn't let me see him, you know, and she was like, oh, the next time that you come, you need to give us two weeks notice and you need to turn up with somebody sober and you need to submit a plan two weeks before you come and see your son and you need to have, I was like, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd had resentment before, but I'd never really had resentment in, in sobriety. I'd had resentment whenever I was drinking and using. I quickly just fucking numbed myself, you know? So my resentments didn't really last that long or they were so numbed that they weren't like what they were in sobriety. And I was just like, it was, it was killing me. It was totally and utterly killing me. It was all consuming. And I remember my sponsor saying, why don't you try praying for her? I was going, oh, but I don't think you understand. It's like, and then I started telling him all of the story and the history. He says, no, no, he says, pray for her. I was just looking at him, I was going, what? He says, pray for her. I was just like, but I don't think you understand. And he's going, no, he says, just pray for her. I can remember inside just thinking, what shit advice to give anybody, you know? And he wasn't listening to what she was doing and how she was torturing. He didn't care what she was doing or how she was torturing me or how unjust or how unfair it was. He didn't care. And I was just like, well, I've just picked the wrong sponsor. You know? Just picked the wrong sponsor and I'm going to change sponsor. Oh, and then I remembered that what he had told me. Or I remember, like, just his example and listen to how he sorted his problems you know and I can remember starting to pray and in the beginning I didn't know how to pray you know? I knew some prayers for when I grew up like the Hail Mary and the Our Father and the glory be to the Father stuff like that so I started quoting these things out and nothing was happening and then I went back to I says well what do you mean how do you pray how am I supposed to pray for her he says, you just wish that she has everything that you want. And I was going, that's it. He says, yeah. 
just wish that she has everything that you want. That's all right. So I remember going back and it was like, it was like really awkward, you know? I was going, God, it's, um, I was like having a conversation with him. And I was going, oh, can Annette uh, be happy? Can she um, have money? Can she, you know, and it was just really, I didn't know what it was, you know, I was just, this list of stupid things that I thought I wanted for myself. You know, but I started doing it, you know, and then after a week, it would come a little bit more smooth. I was like, God, it's like, I hope that Annette has a peaceful day. And she has a beautiful connection with Teo, son. I hope that she's happy with her family. And then after about three weeks, it was just like, I hope that Annette is happy, that she's healthy, that she's safe, that she's peace. I hope that she never wants for anything. No, it was just coming naturally. And I promised after three weeks, the resentment towards her just was, was gone. Totally and utterly gone. Gone. I was like, wow, wow. It's like, I remember sending my sponsor, I was going, it's like, it's gone. It's like, I don't, I'm not obsessing about her. I'm not thinking about her. I don't want revenge. I don't want to kill her. I don't want to hurt her. It's gone. But that was it for me. I was just sold. I was sold on the power of prayer. Totally and at least sold. And then for me, it was step four. You know, and step four is amazing. You know, it gets a lot of bad press, but I don't know why. For me, it really wasn't that difficult. It wasn't really that painful. The most painful part of step four for me was the indecision around not doing it. You know, my sponsor gave me really clear instructions on what to do. I sat out in the big book, you know, it's really clear. And I went away and I took about two, three weeks and I'd done nothing. You know, I threw lines on pages and started to make lists and then I'd rip the list up and start again. You know, and it was doing my head in. It was driving me nuts. And I said to him, I says, look, I think it was a Thursday. I says, just give me a date. Give me a time next week when we can do this. And he says, right, Tuesday. So I said, right. So I basically took Monday and Tuesday off work. On Friday, went into work, started making a list. And then that weekend, I just, I took Saturday, Sunday. I was off Monday and Tuesday. And I just, I'd done it all. I just dedicated those four days to, I've just done it. So um, I sat down with him and, and done my step five. And it was lasted maybe about three, four hours. Just told him it all. No. I just what an experience, you know. All of that hate, all of that anger, all of that resentment, all of that fear, all of that shit that I never told anybody about for years that I carried around a huge big burden weighing me down. I thought that I was like made of glass and that you could see through me and you knew how I felt, you knew how I thought, you know, that's what I thought, I thought you knew me, you knew how I felt, I was ashamed and then I shared it with another man and it was just all removed, every last single thing was just gone, it was taken from me totally taken from me. No. All the guilt, the shame, the remorse. And it was just like, 
Wow. And, you know, step four and five, it was just a massive spiritual experience for me. It was the freeing of Julian, you know, and all the stuff that I thought was really made me special and different really wasn't that special and different at all. I was just like everybody else. You know, my sponsor laughed at me, you know, which I find really fucking humiliating at the time until about 30 seconds after he started laughing at me, you know, and then I was, I was laughing at the stupidity and the futility of stuff that I'd held on to for years. Uh, and then for six and seven, you know, sorry, just on five, you know, step five for me was amazing because I really struggled with male relationships, you know, and it was that thing, even as a child, I always thought that you were going to judge me, you know, that it was a war, that there was a competition, you know, and to speak to another man openly and honestly and tell him stuff without any fear of retribution was just a life-changing experience for me, you know, and allowed me to go on and have other relationships with other men and other women. You know, what a gift. You know, not only did I clear away all my shit, but I would now knew how to communicate with people and have a relationship. And then six and seven, just, you know, looking at all of my my character defects and all of my assets. For every defect I, I recognize, I've got an asset. You know, that's just a beautiful thing. I used to always concentrate on what was wrong with me. But if there's something wrong with me, then there's also something right with me. It was everything that I do. If I'm full of fear, I've also got faith. You know, I've got lots of anger. I've got lots of love. I'm capable of all of these things. And to be able to see myself as a balanced, humble individual is amazing. You know, whenever I started making amends for me, it was just so cool, man. What an amazing experience to repair all of those relationships. You know, I walked out on my kids when they were young. I sorted out the relationship with their mother, sorted out the relationship with them, with my parents, with my grandparents, school teachers, everybody. And again, it just sets me free. Oh, it just sets me free. And then I just try to continue to maintain stuff now with 10, 11, and 12. You know, I continue to do, to take inventory on a daily basis. I pray, I meditate. You know, I've become a seeker, you know. Trying to seek, actively seek to expand upon my spiritual life. You know, I go to the Buddhist center, I study Buddhism and meditation. I want to become a meditation teacher. I'm always trying to take time in my life to find, you know, just little spaces where I can pray, where I can breathe, where I can connect. And, you know, I have step 12 had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. And I tried to carry this message. You know? I don't always practice these principles to the best of my powers. Like I said at the beginning, you know, yesterday was a disaster. I didn't practice any of this. You know, the ism, the disease was on me and I just, you know, I couldn't do it. But today I could, you know, that's it. I've realized I've gone on. So I'm just very grateful to be here. I'm very grateful to be sober. You know, and I hope I've basically been of help to someone tonight. And I wish you all the very best. And may you have a long life and a wonderful recovery. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.